All right, let's get started. Um, before we get it, is there anyone who doesn't speak Czech? Everyone speaks Czech? Well, and uh, does any one of you mind if I speak in English? No, everyone's fine with that. Okay, the reason for that is that uh, actually uh, on this course, we have uh, 27 students registered. It doesn't seem like that at the moment, but uh, that's how it is. And many of those are uh, Erasmus students. So uh, for, for those reasons, I'll start with English. And uh, eventually, if uh, everyone from Erasmus just doesn't attend, then we can switch to Czech. Right. So welcome to uh, the web services course. Uh, in this semester, um, I will talk about um, what's the uh, height behind the term web services. It is actually not uh, one thing. It's a set of different uh, stacks, technological stacks, and uh, lots of architectures and so on. Um, so it's not just one thing. There are many types and, and all that. And I will wait for a bit. <laughs> Okay, so once again, welcome to the web services course. Um, first of all, I will start with a term that some of you may have already heard uh, that actually doesn't have much to do with what we are going to talk about during this semester. However, there is, of course, some relation and um, I will try to explain it. So the term I'm talking about is SOA or service oriented architecture. As you can see from the title, it is an architecture. So it is not a technological stack. It is uh, a style of creating information systems that uh, has some uh, benefits and addresses some challenges. Um, but mainly it is a, uh, or it is on the business level, not on the technological level. So when we talk about SOA, we are talking about uh, splitting business functions of information systems into services, which are again, business services, not web services or uh, any other specific technological service. Um, and uh, this architectural style is focused on uh, basically splitting the functionalities of information systems on the business level into, um, into items or, oh yes, services. Um, which uh, the style addresses uh, various challenges. Imagine that you have uh, two banks, so large organizations with variety of information systems, uh, and uh, some of those systems may be old, uh, like 20 years old and so on. And now uh, those two banks uh, are to merge. And uh, now imagine that each bank uh, the information systems run on uh, different hardware, they run on different operating systems, different technologies, use different protocols and so on. So to merge those two huge information systems is really a challenge and uh, the uh, service oriented architecture is a style that helps with this because, um, well, when you have a uh, SOA service, which again is a business service, so don't don't seek any implementation behind that at, the, at this moment. Um, you basically say that every business service, which is a business function, such as uh, payment by credit card or something like that, uh, it has to be well defined, which means it has inputs and outputs. So uh, if you are going to do a credit card pay, credit card payment on the input, you need the credit card number and the expiry date and so on. Uh, you all know that. And the output is uh, okay, the payment went through or um, something else. So that's a business service from the SOA point of view. And uh, yeah, it performs a specific task, which means yes, it allows you to pay for something. Uh, but uh, because it is well, well defined, 
It is also reusable because in many business processes, which means any, in, in many processes that happen from the business point of view in an enterprise, in many of them, you'll find that the client needs to pay for something using a credit card. And you can use this service in all of those processes. So uh, yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's actually the composability part here. Um, and also this service such as credit card payment is self-contained, meaning it doesn't rely on any other um, services or any other information systems in order to do its function. So uh, there is a clear border around uh, such a service, such as payment by credit card. And you know that if you supply it with all the, all the required inputs, it will do its function regardless of uh, what's going on in other, other systems. So it can be part of many business processes. Um, the SOA principles are, um, well, there's a couple of them. Um, they are listed here, the most basic ones. So loose coupling means that the service doesn't have any dependencies that uh, it doesn't uh, need. Um, so it has, as le uh, <clears throat> well, it doesn't have any unnecessary dependencies. Uh, it is abstracted, so it, is, it has clearly defined interfaces. It has hidden implementation, which means you can switch the actual implementation anytime, but the interface stays the same. Um, well, it's reusable, so you can use it in many uh, different processes. It's stateless, so uh, all the uh, information that the service needs needs to be supplied to it on the input so that it doesn't have to query anything else and do its, uh, do its business. And uh, yeah, well, those uh, services, because in a typical enterprise such as a bank, you will have many and many of those services doing some small stuff. So you need the services to be discoverable. Typically, there is a registry of services, a catalog of services. And uh, there is a, um, well, uh, presumption that the service will be able to evolve in time. Um, so it will be able to react to any business, new business requirements that may come. So that's the agility part. So as you can see, really, this is just architecture. It's, it's a way of uh, thinking about splitting an information system before you, let's say, actually start um, implementing something. And the relationship between SOA and web services, which we will talk about uh, in this course, is that, uh, well, SOA describes a system on the business level. However, those services can be implemented in many different ways. Web services are a specific technological stack that can be used to implement, of course, the SOA um, architecture and the SOA services. Uh, but it's not the only way of implementing SOA, so it's one of the ways. But we are going to talk about web services. So we are going to talk about technologies that uh, power web services. And uh, because of that, and because I'm not sure what courses you have already finished and uh, uh, what uh, actual knowledge of uh, the prerequisites you already have, Today's lecture will be about what you should already know, basically. So I will very quickly walk through uh, some uh, basic technologies that uh, we will all need when working with web services during this course. And because we are going or oh, talking about web services, we are going, uh, talking about the web, we also need to be talking about the internet. And the internet uh, basically runs on a network stack, uh, the TCP IP network stack that uh, I presume you all already know, but let's review a little bit what's, what's uh, important about this stack. So uh, going from the bottom level, this, uh, this first layer is about the physical networking. So that's a wireless and wired uh, networking and so on. And basically it is about delivering zeros and ones from one network adapter to another, nothing else. When you have that solved, and there are many ways of solving that, like I said, wired and uh, not wired and so on, you can move one level up. So you are abstracting from, from uh, the specificities of 
the individual physical layers, and you can talk about um, the actual network. So now we are talking about communicating from one computer uh, to another within one network. When you have that, you can say, okay, now we have a network of networks. We have the internet. And for that, you have another layer, uh, the IP layer, which uh, deals with actually delivering a message from a computer in one network to a computer in another network. On top of that, you have the TCP or UDP layer, which uh, again abstracts from uh, what is on the path from one computer to another and deals with, uh, okay, I have a computer and on that computer I have many processes and each process needs to communicate with another process running on another computer somewhere in the internet. So that's what we um, deal with on the TCP or UDP layer. So the processes on one computer are identified by port numbers. I, of course, forgot to mention that the computers on the internet are identified, are identified by IP addresses, but that's, that's a given. And then when you have this, so one application running on one computer can communicate with any application running on any other computer, then we can talk about application protocols. So what they are actually going to talk about um, in, in terms of functionality. So this is the basics of, of networking. And um, I hope you all uh, understand how this works because we will work with sending messages over the internet in this course, and we really need to understand what's happening. Um, now, another, part of uh, what we are going to need. Um, and again, I hope that this is uh, a uh, well, review for most of you, um, are identifiers. So when we are going to identify something on the web, we are going to use URIs or URLs, sometimes IRIs, and sometimes even URNs. Before I go into the details, who of you would be able to define those four terms and uh, explain what are the differences between those four acronyms? I'm not going to ask you to, but uh, I'm just probing who knows it. Okay, one. Okay, so this actually seems to be a useful review. So when we are going to talk about these acronyms, they will, um, or the actual strings identified or um, called these will be uh, similar. They will look something like this. So this is something you are all familiar with because you all know URLs because you use them when you are browsing the internet, right? When you are browsing the web, the web pages. Uh, so you know URL, you know what it does. Actually, those are two separate things, what, what a URL does. It identifies the web page. That means that uh, if you see two URLs and they are identical, they are identical uh, strings, you know that the web pages they identify are in fact just one web page because the identifiers are the same. So this functionality alone is the functionality of an identifier. So if we want nothing more from the string that then just to differentiate between different things, such as web pages, then we are talking about a URI, Uniform Resource Identifier. One thing you cannot do or cannot expect from a identifier, such as this one, is the thing that you all do on a day-by-day -day basis, and that is that you take this identifier and you use it with an HTTP client, for instance, such as a web browser, to actually locate the identified web page on the internet and get it. But that's a separate functionality. And if you say that your URI also has this functionality, then you are talking about a URL, about a locator. So a locator has two functions. It is an ident identifier and it also has the functionality that if you use it with a, an appropriate client, it will locate the identified thing and allow you to actually access it. Okay, so now 
we have the difference between a URI and a URL explained. Uh, what about the other, uh, other acronyms? Let's start with an IRI because that's um, uh, easier to explain. A difference between an IRI, and again, you can see it's an identifier, so it will relate to the URI, is that in the path part here, here, you can use Unicode characters. In URI, you can use US ASCII. Uh, in IRIs, in the path part here, you can use Unicode, such as um, Chinese and Czech uh, characters and emojis and so on. So that's the difference. And again, if you use uh, IRIs and you say that it is also a locator, then you again get a URL. So that's a little bit weird because there is no such thing as an IRL. So if you are saying URL, that could mean both URI and IRI based URL. Uh, right, one thing I forgot to mention, of course, is the inner syntax of a URI. So there are syntactical parts of a URI. There is a scheme, then there is the authority part, which contains in the case of um, HTTP and HTTPS schemes and similar, it contains the domain name or an IP address and a port number. Then there is the path part where there is a difference between URI and IRI. And then there is a query part and a fragment part. Now, um, regarding the fragment part, it is maybe an interesting fact that uh, when you use it, um, it only gets processed by the uh, end client. It doesn't uh, get sent to a web server, for instance. So um, if you have a web page URL with a fragment and you use the HTTP protocol to get that page, uh, the server actually sees the URL up to the fragment part. And then uh, the fragment part is processed within the web page within your client. So the server actually doesn't see the fragment part. Um, Right, and uh, that leads us to URN. URN is a special URI with the URN scheme. Um, now, if, if you think about it, uh, the URI, URL, and IRI in the authority part, because they use domain names, um, they are somehow related to the owner of that resource or the location of that resource, even if it is just a URI, because it uses the do domain names. In URNs, the URNs are specifically designed to be location independent URIs. So they use the URN scheme. Then the first part here, you can actually register in the INR URN namespace registry. So here you can register your first part of a URN and then it is yours. And then uh, you can structure the URN as you wish. A uh, best practice is to use uh, semicolons uh, or colons like these to actually uh, separate the individual parts of the URM. Right, so now it should be clear what a URI, IRI, URL, and URN are. Uh, and actually, uh, in other courses where I explain this difference, URNs are not so um, often used, but in web services, they are. So you will come across URNs. So it is good to know what they actually mean. And there are many different kinds of uh, URIs that you probably all know. So there is the, of course, HTTP, HTTPS URI, then FTP, which uses the now obsolete, basically, FTP protocol. Uh, the interesting parts or interesting ones are the mail to URIs. So if you, again, know this, if you want to make a clickable link to an email address on the web, you use the mail to scheme and this is then a URI. The same goes for telephone numbers, which is a less known fact. And uh, yeah, this is one of these URNs that actually uh, identify a specific specification that uh, we won't talk about, but uh, yeah, the similar URNs are used for other specifications as well. And those ones we'll see. Before we proceed, I need to mention one more thing about the IRI, and that is that uh, with the HTTP protocol, again, that we will use a lot, um, only URIs are usable. So the HTTP protocol works correctly only with URIs. 
So what happens with IRIs when they are to be used with HTTP? Well, part of the IRI specification, which is um, published as an RFC, is a mapping algorithm from IRIs with Unicode characters to URIs with US ASCII only characters. And basically, because with uh, Unicode, one character can be encoded by one to four bytes, each byte of that character is then percent encoded. So here, this emoji has four bytes, so it has four percent encoded sequences, where we have the percent sign and then the hexadecimal representation of that byte. So here we have four bytes. Well, which means that when we actually transform the IRIs to URIs, they look like this. They are not very readable, but they are uh, valid URIs. And those are then used with the HTTP protocol. Um, one more thing, if you work with IRIs, you might come across a problem with web browsers, because when you see an IRI in a web browser, that's fine, you see it like this. But uh, when you copy it to, for instance, paste it somewhere else, what you will actually copy is the encoded, uh, encoded variant, which is not very readable. So if you want to, let's say, copy the IRI and send it via WhatsApp to your friend, they will see this, which is not very practical. Uh, it's ugly and it's long. So for, uh, to, to make this easier, because there is a big debate actually uh, within the web browser developer community about whether this copying of, of the encoded part is a good practice or not. So it is not resolved yet. Uh, I think it is not, but uh, yeah, <laughs> nowadays it's implemented like this. So for this reason, there is a Chrome um, extension that you can install. And then when you click, you get this IRI copied as it is, uh, and you can use it. Uh, this is all just to let you know that uh, when you are debugging your web services later, if you use IRIs, you might come across something like this so that you know what's happening. Um, there is another part of uh, a URI where you can actually use Unicode characters, and that's the domain name. Um, so again, you can do it. Uh, and again, the uh, URI like this with, with IDN, internationalized domain name, it will get again translated to a regular URI that will look something like this. You may notice that there is no percent encoding here, and that's because the encoding of uh, the domain name works with a different algorithm called Punicode, and it looks um, the result looks like this. And this is actually the domain name that you then register with, uh, with DNS. And when in your web browser you enter this, it will actually work. Um, so if you are using Unicode characters in IRIs or URIs, uh, you need to be sure that your library actually works with Punicode and IRI percent encoding. Right, another thing I want to mention is uh, I already ran into IANA, which uh, are um, authoritative lists of some things like the first parts of your ends or media types, which are formats used for data representation on the web. They are registered uh, in, in the list. This, by the way, is clickable, of course, in the slides that are... Uh, uh, I forgot to mention that uh, this course is described on a web page. If you haven't seen that web page, take a look. Uh, there is a list of lectures, list of tutorials, um, and all the slides in uh, um, non-PDF form. So it's a, it's a Google slide, you can click, and so on. Um, I forgot to mention one more thing. This course ran in a distant form for two years now. So uh, all the materials you'll need are also available on the web and in the slides and as speaker's comments. So, um, yeah, just saying. Okay, back to media types. Uh, those are, uh, yeah, data formats usable on the web. And uh, ideally, all the formats that are used on the web would be registered here. It's not the case, unfortunately, but the most, uh, most used ones are. And so we will uh, definitely see 
for instance, application slash SOAP plus XML. Uh, one interesting thing here is that uh, even the media type has some inner syntax. So the most simple ones uh, look like this. They start with text if they are actually readable texts, or they start with application if they are not meant for human reading. And uh, then there is the identifier of the format. And if you see this plus sign, it means that SOAP is an XML format. So uh, the, the, the plus sign here identifies a serialization. So we might have formats that can be serialized in many different other formats, such as XML, JSON, and so on. And uh, that is then what you indicate by the plus sign. If you have some uh, formats that are not uh, developed independently, but some uh, actual vendor of a software publishes description of such a format, the, the media type starts with VND dot. And um, if you see a media type like this, starting with X and a dash, that's uh, actually not recommended. It's deprecated and discouraged and so on. It means that someone is using a format that they know they should register with IANA, but they didn't do it. So they invented another identifier that is not registered anywhere, is not recognized by anyone, and starts with X. So that shouldn't happen anymore, but still it does. Right, so those were identifiers and uh, media types. Another thing we need to remind ourselves about is the already mentioned HTTP protocol. Again, I presume that uh, you are all familiar, but even though, because we are talking about web services and they are really, really, really based on HTTP, we need to know what's happening with HTTP. So HTTP, again, uh, is uh, a hypertext transfer protocol. So, so the, it's clear that it's a protocol. It's clear that it's a transfer protocol. Now, what is a hypertext? Does anyone know what's a hypertext? And who knows and doesn't want to say? OK, well, you all know what text is, right? That's characters meant to be read by people. Hypertext is text which contains links to other texts. So typically, hypertext is um, encoded in HTML, but also Markdown and uh, other formats which support linking from parts of text to another text. And HTTP is a protocol for transfer, uh, to, for transfer of hypertext because it was initially meant only for web pages, so it made sense. Uh, nowadays, it is used for almost anything, so now it uh, definitely doesn't hold that HTTP transfer, uh, transfers only hypertext. Um, it is text-based, which means that uh, if you want to see the HTTP communication, you can see it, and you can read it, and you can understand it as a human being, which we will try in one of the tutorials, actually, on the first tutorial tomorrow. Um, it is a request response based protocol, which means that uh, a client, such as a web browser, creates a request, sends it to the server. The server receives the request and uh, does something and sends a response. So that's not complicated. What's a bit more complicated is that it is stateless, which you might have noticed is one of the principles of service oriented architecture that the services are stateless. Well, HTTP servers are also stateless, and it means that everything the server needs to perform an operation for a client needs to be provided in the request, because the server doesn't hold any state, which means that everything it needs to, to do something needs to be supplied to it in the input, and then it forgets that this um, request response actually happened. And that's it. It has no state, the server. And the protocol is designed so that this can be done. And let's start with uh, version 1.0 of that protocol. It's actually not the first one, but uh, it's well, 1.0. So it's a good point to start. And uh, this is how a simple HTTP 1.0 request looks like. Um, it has some syntax, of course. You can see it's text, so you can read it, you can understand it. 
And uh, what we have here is uh, something called an HTTP method. So that's basically saying, what do you want the server to do? Then we have uh, identification of the protocol version because you, you know that there are many versions of HTTP. So the server needs to know what version is the client using so that it can respond uh, using the same version. Um, now, in between the method and the protocol version, there is the path. Here, it's really simple. It's just a slash. It means give me the root document. And uh, you can imagine that if I access a URL like this in my web browser, the slash is the path. So it's the, the, the path behind the uh, domain name and the port number. Right, and um, then after this first row, there is a block of uh, headers. Headers are key keys and values. Um, each key has some kind of meaning. Uh, for instance, accept header has the meaning saying that the client accepts representations of resources in this particular format. This format is the media type for HTML. So this is saying the client wants an HTML representation of the resource identified by this URL. Actually, it's, it's just saying it wants the representation of the resource identified by slash from the server it is connected to and to where, where it is sending the request. Now, there is one slight problem here or potential problem. When you imagine the internet and the web as it is today, uh, it happens that uh, you have providers of web hosting, right? Which uh, they basically run one server and on that one server, they have many websites hosted. And each website can have a different domain name. So if you take a look at this request, there is no domain name sent to the server. And if you remind yourself um, about how actually you get to connect to that server, it works like this. You enter this URL into your web browser and the web browser translates the domain name into an IP address, right? And then connects to this IP address on port 80 because it is HTTP and sent this request. So in this request, there is no linked open data CZ. There is a, just a slash and it connects to this IP address. So how can such a web hosting server actually work? Because I connect to it, I request the slash, but how does it know that it should be the root document of this particular website when all it knows is its IP address and the slash? So I presume you know, but uh, just checking who actually knows the answer to this. Well, yes. <laughs> Okay, this actually with HTTP 1.0 is a real problem and cannot be solved in a standard way. That's why we have HTTP 1.1, where we have the host header, which contains the domain name, and that enables the, the server to actually see the requested domain name and provide the requested uh, website. Um, so in HTTP 1.1, you can see the version indicated here. The host header is mandatory because this is such a common situation that uh, you just need to provide the host name here. Right. Um, so let's uh, let's continue. Um, we have the uh, the method, the path, and the version. Then we have the headers. Then we have two new lines. That's part of the protocol that the header block is separated by new, two new lines from the body of the request. And then we can have a body of the request. Um, we'll get to what can be in the body of the request later, because first we need to discuss the different methods uh, that we can use with HTTP. So um, I guess you all are familiar with the get method, which is the method to actually get a web page. So, um, yeah, this is the most common method, but it's not the only one, and uh, it may uh, also not be uh, one of the useful ones or the most useful ones. Um, 
there are other ones that uh, should be implemented on a web server and again uh, in often uh, often enough they are they are not implemented which then can be a problem um, one of the methods is head which should return only the uh, header block and not the body so if you want to see whether a resource is actually present on a server and you don't want that resource you just want to see whether it is there you use the http head method to do it and it should be quite quick because it just returns the headers saying yes this resource exists and it is of this data format and so on it was modified some some when and and so on so you get all the metadata and you don't get the um, the the resource if you imagine that the resource was a uh, movie for instance uh, which can be a few gigabytes large then it makes sense uh, to just probe the resource first using http head now options is a bit similar but it gives you a list of possible actions that you can do with uh, the resource options is often used with restful web services um, and such so we will get to it uh, most uh, the most prominent usage of options is to enable course cross-origin resource sharing uh, which is a technique that you need if you run web-based applications and they are to access resources on another domain. Um, so that's uh, just a side note. Um, another important method is post, which uh, you use to actually upload some content. And uh, the meaning of post is uh, to make the body of the request a child of the request you are posting to in some um, in some semantic or in some meaning um, the actual meaning is then application dependent uh, right so another method put is actually is used to replace whatever resource uh, it uh, well replace the resource with another representation delete is used to delete the resource um, and then uh, some less used methods such as trace and connect so this is just to give you a quick overview of the methods the methods can be classified using various properties such as um, some of the met methods are so-called safe which means that if you do the request with get or head you should be confident that you cannot break anything on the server nothing should change you just get the resource or the metadata uh, which is not the case with the other methods such as delete right because if you just try delete and um, you have access, you delete a resource, so that's not uh, entirely safe. And then another property is idempotency, which means that if you run the same method, uh, the same request with this method many times, the result should be the same as if you run it just one time. So this is important in unreliable communication, because if you uh, send the request and you don't get any response, you don't know whether the request actually was done or not because the response could get lost. Uh, so you are free to do this operation again and again and again until you get a response and you can feel again safe that uh, the effect will be the same as if uh, the operation was done only once. This is not the case for post, of course, because the post will create new and new and new representations of what you are uh, uploading. Uh, right, so that was the HTTP request. Let's take a look at the response. So in the response, you see the protocol version. Then you can see uh, the response code. This is important because it tells you how it went, how what has happened, and if something needs to be done. Um, there is an optional textual representation of the code. Uh, I say optional. It really sometimes happens that the server just relies on the fact that the client knows what the response code means and therefore there is no text sometimes then there are again uh, headers there is uh, two new lines and then there is the body of the response in this case we are getting um, an html page uh, which is uh, indicated by the content type in the headers and then you can see html in the body uh, in this case uh, the return code says that you should look somewhere else, but it also provides an HTML version of this so that you can, as a web browser, display something to your user. 
Now, talking about response codes and how they are important, there are five basic classes of response codes um, differentiated by the first number. Uh, the response code is intentionally uh, made of three numbers because uh, initially it was thought that uh, some of the clients will be um, simple and therefore they will just understand the first number and some clients will be more complex and they will understand the first two numbers and some clients will be proper clients and they will understand all three numbers of the response code so that's um, why we have five classes which uh, have of course a meaning one means informational so the server wants the client to know something but doesn't expect any action two means that the request went okay but it doesn't say anything else uh, three means that uh, the client needs to contact some other uh, url to to continue with what they are doing four means client error so typically the client did something wrong requested something that doesn't exist or uh, the request was malformed or something like that and five means that uh, the request of the client was understood by the server but for some reason the server failed to um, send a response and uh, the client should try again later basically now we can go into more detail because uh, this is something that is often overlooked and um, shouldn't be um, especially in web services when you are coding against an api that should communicate back what is happening right so uh, it is not enough to know 200 okay or 404 not found um, you need to understand a little bit more about uh, about the response codes not everyone every one of those because there are really many uh, but at least the bold ones here on the slides you should you should know about so the most common one is continue so the server says okay what do you want me to do next or something like that switching protocols happens when you are for instance upgrading from http 1.1 to http 2.0 uh, so that's a response code that the server sends when the client says okay i will communicate with you now or i will send you the request in http 1.1 but I also know how to handle HTTP 2.0. If you, dear server, also know HTTP 2.0, send me back 101 and we will communicate using HTTP 2.0. So that's 101 switching protocols. It can be used also for other protocols than HTTP. So you can uh, negotiate with the server the usage of another protocol than HTTP using this. Then the two are uh, pretty straightforward so 200 okay is yes here you have what you requested uh, typically it's accompanied with a body uh, in the response 201 created so typically in response to a post uh, method uh, the server informs you that the resource that uh, you wanted to create is really created no content is um, interesting it's 204 sometimes confused with 404 because it actually doesn't contain uh, anybody but it's a two class uh, response code so it means the request went okay there is just no content to return typically in response to a delete method request so if you delete something you'll get 204 because it says okay it was deleted it's a two based code but there is nothing to be returned so no content now with three uh, class codes that's a redirection. So for instance, you access an HTTP based URI and you get re redirected to an HTTPS based URI. So that's the most typical one, but it can be used in another way as well. Uh, when we are going to talk about RESTful web services, we are going to talk about the fact that you can re request a uh, representation of one resource in multiple formats. For instance, I can have one URL and one application can say, I want to see a representation of, in HTML of this URL. And another application may say, I want to see the XML representation of this URL or RDF representation of this URL. And the server may respond with, for instance, 303 saying, oh, you wanted the HTML representation, that's this URL. And it's another URL um, and you can access that one. Uh, yeah, then uh, 301 and 302, also important. 301 moved permanently, which means the survey is saying to you, next time, don't ask me again. Remember, 
that this is moved permanently. Really, this is something that should be cached and the client then can automatically um, request the new URL. CO2 is temporary red redirect, so this is not to be cached. Uh, yep. So, so far, no consent is the typical response for the head, uh, right? Uh, no. <laughs> no, um, because um, the head, uh, the response to a head request should be identical to the response of the get request, only uh, it will not contain the body. So uh, you should know, uh, yeah, so typically it's also okay. Uh, it could be no content. Uh, you're right. Um, yeah, and that might depend on the implementation. But uh, yeah, I don't see a reason why it couldn't be also go for. Yeah. Um, right. Then the 400, those you will come across uh, the most frequently because typically when you're learning something, you do mistakes. And this is how the server lets you know that something is wrong with your request as a client. So the most typical is 400 bad requests. That happens when your request is syntactically incorrect or um, just something is wrong with the request. 401, unauthorized means that you are trying to access a request um, and you need to log in or provide some credentials in order to be able to access that, re um, that, that resource. 403 is that uh, the server knows who you are and you do not have access to that resource. So there is a difference. Then 404 not found is, yeah, you're requesting something that is not found on the server. Uh, what also quite often happens is 405, method not allowed. That is typical when you are accessing a web server, for instance, using the head method, and the web server doesn't implement the head method, which shouldn't happen, but it happens, and then it responds with method not allowed. And uh, not acceptable, well, that's, for instance, if you try to create something that the server just won't accept due to some application-specific reasons. Um, yeah, the, uh, one interesting one is 410, gone, which is the correct response to give when something was on the web server, but it was deleted. So when something was on the web server, it got deleted, and then someone requests it, um, the correct response is not 404, but it is gone. There is a difference because gone means yes, this was here and it is no longer here. 404 is just, I don't know. So yeah, 410 gone. Um, yeah, and then uh, one of the newest response codes here, the list is uh, always evolving. So one of the newest ones is unavailable for legal reasons. That might happen if, um, for instance, you are trying to access a gambling site, which is on a government blacklist. So some server on the way, will terminate your request and return 451 unavailable for legal reasons. Um, right, so that was the HTTP protocol. And uh, as I mentioned, we will play with it um, on the tutorial because uh, yeah, it is just important to get the feeling of what is happening uh, when you are sending messages to a server. Uh, and because we are going to talk about uh, for, for the first half of the semester about W3C style web services. And I will explain what it is as we get to it. We will work with XML a lot. So I also need to remind you about XML, what it is and what, what are the common mistakes. Um, so XML, extensible markup language. Um, basically, if you know HTML, this is uh, well similar. It is also a markup language, but it is used with uh, generic data. So you have uh, your XML uh, header here stating the version of XML. There are two main versions, 1.0 and 1.1. 1.1 1 .1 is newer, but it never uh, was widespread. So typically you will come across 1.0 here and the character encoding. Again, we will use UTF-8 in most cases, but if you communicate with some legacy systems, you might come across different encoding specified here and then used in the document. Then you can have comments like this. And then in an XML document, you have one root element. There is only one, you cannot have two. Um, 
you can have empty elements, elements with attributes. Uh, attributes can have multiple values. If they are separated by a space, it, it means it's multiple values. And elements can have sub elements and elements can have text content and mixed content. We won't come across mixed content. That's, uh, that means that uh, you have a text and within the text you have suddenly another sub element. So that's mixed content. We won't come across that, I think. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, this is the basics of XML. So common mistakes that you can do when working with XML documents is that you can have uh, another root element that's invalid. Um, you can have bad nesting or ba uh, bad enclosing symbol. XML element names are case sensitive. So here we had element B with capital B, and here we are closing it with element B, which is lowercase b. So that's invalid. Um, an element has a start tag and an end tag. That's something I forgot to mention. Um, and uh, yeah, this is bad nesting where you have element E, then you start element F, and then you try to close element E before you close element F. So that's also invalid. Um, like this, it seems quite clear, but uh, just wait for it as you create your uh, SOAP requests, for instance, later in, in the tutorial. So that was basic XML, but in web services, we will need um, something that's called XML namespaces again quite a lot. So it is important that you are familiar with XML namespaces and qualified names, which is a term that goes with it. Um, let's have a motivational example. So here we have a table, which is an HTML table. And here we have a table, which is a coffee table. So the name of the element seems similar, right? It's table on the left. It is also table on the right but they are two entirely different things. So if you get an XML document with these two mixed, it will be really hard to uh, explain that to the user and really hard to create a schema that will validate the document sometimes as an HTML table and sometimes as a coffee table. So to avoid confusion, and uh, here we are talking about HTML and coffee tables, but in web services, we are talking about many different specifications, each defining a different set of XML elements, all used in one XML document. So there, there really is a need to separate those. We use XML namespaces. So we prefix the element names and the attribute with something called a prefix here. And then we say that this prefix corresponds to a certain namespace, which is identified by a URI. Now, in two different XML documents, you may use different prefixes for the same um, namespace. But the important thing is the URI identifying the namespace, not the prefix used in a particular document. And uh, I also mentioned that uh, with namespaces, there is uh, the term qualified name or Q name uh, that you will come across. A qualified name is nothing more than a pair of things. The first part is the IRI of or the URI of the namespace. And then the second part is the local name of the element within that namespace. So that's what's called a qualified name. And therefore, the qualified name of this table is different than the qualified name of this table because the local element names are the same, but the namespace identifiers are different. So this element really is called by a qualified name, which is a pair, this URI and the string table. And this again has a qualified name, which is this URI and the string table. It really doesn't matter how you call this prefix. It can be arbitrary, but it needs to of course match the definition of the namespace. The namespaces are defined we are, uh, as attributes like these, XML and S, colon, and the prefix that you wish to use for the namespace. The namespace definition uh, is applicable to the whole subtree of an XML element. Now, because this is how it works, it's applicable to the subtree of the element. It is quite common that in the root element, you actually define all the namespaces you use throughout the document. Um, so that it is clear what to expect, but it is not necessary. 
uh, you can define the namespaces wherever you want. Um, but yeah, uh, it is nicer to have all of those defined on the root element so that it is clear what will be used within the document. Um, there is one special namespace, which is default namespace. If you define it like this without the colon and the prefix, it means that all these elements are actually identified by qualified names where the namespace array is this and this is the local name. So if in your document, and you can combine those, you can have uh, a default namespace definition and then specific namespace definitions. And those can also, uh, yeah, <laughs> question. Uh, yes, you can. But then it means, then it's even more confusing because then it means that, uh, for instance, if this attribute was here with the TR element, it would mean that the root element and the table element are uh, elements with no namespace. And then the TR and TD elements are elements with qualified names from this namespace. Would it be helpful Yes, you can, you can redefine the namespace. But that's even more confusing. So, uh, yeah. But yes, it might happen. And uh, some unexplainable errors that might happen to you might have this explanation. So, uh, yeah, namespaces, uh, prefixes, and default namespace. Right. So, that was XML and namespaces. Just a quick reminder. And when we have XML documents, we might want to query those documents to actually get some pieces of data in those documents. So for that, we have the XPath language. It, um, yeah, it's a web standard, W3C documentation. Um, it uses uh, terms like these, it uses paths. So if you imagine the XML document as a tree, you can go through the individual levels using this path. You might also know this from uh, navigating your file system on your uh, computer, where you also, well, on Linux-based systems, you have a root and then you go down. On Windows-based systems, you have multiple routes, um, but still it holds that uh, you uh, specify the path to a certain file you want to identify or access or open or something. And this is the same thing. And um, an absolute path starts in the root of the XML document. A relative path can start anywhere, but then you need to know what is the current node uh, where you actually start uh, evaluating this relative path. So those are the simpler expressions in XPath, but uh, in fact, uh, each step uh, can have an axis saying in which direction basically uh, you are performing or on which set of nodes you are performing a node test. The name of the node is then called in general a node test. So you, by axis, you select a subset of the elements and by node test you filter uh, those only to the ones named well whatever this name will be we'll have specific examples in a bit and then you can have a set of predicates which are filters um, that you apply to the currently selected set of nodes and there is a handy table that you can use whenever you need to you know remind yourself of the functions and all the axes and uh, the shortcuts uh, available in XPath. So I'm just pointing that out. Um, and this is the now, uh, I guess, a little bit famous image of all the different axes uh, displayed on an XML document. So here you have a node where you, when you start evaluating, and uh, this is the whole XML tree. And now you can use the parent axis the ancestor and uh, the child and self and so on. So really you can navigate the XML uh, tree as you wish using XPath. One thing you need to know is that there is such a thing as an XML document order. So each element has a number assigned saying um, the order of that element in that document. And uh, the way it is computed is that uh, you basically, when you process the XML document, you count the opening tags and each element gets a number assigned by, well, this number assigned. So book is number one, chapter is number two, section is number three, this chapter is number four, this section is number five, and so on. So that's the document order. It becomes important when you are using the uh, preceding and following 
axes. So if you ever need that, just uh, know that, uh, well, there is such a thing. Now, some common errors. So uh, let's have a XML document containing rental car companies uh, in Hawaii. And uh, well, let's select a car rental companies in Hawaii, which offer at least one Cabrio. So that's a query, and we can express it in XPath on that hypothetical XML document. And it can look like this. So we go to rental companies, tilt to those that are in Hawaii, and uh, their offers and car cars of type Cabrio. So is this correct? That's a quick test if you know XPath. If you have the slides, then you already know the, the answer. It is not correct. Because if you take a look at the end, what you get is actually cars of type Cabrio, because you get the nodes car, which cannot be the answer to a question asking for a rental car companies. The rental car companies are here. So the correct answer is, well, you want rental car companies that satisfy some condition, the condition is the predicate. So it needs to be in those brackets. And the predicate is that the rental car company is in Hawaii and has an offer, which is a car of a type Cabrio. So uh, yeah, so even a simple query can get a bit complicated, uh, but again, um, yeah, you will see that as you try it out. Uh, another example, uh, there are syntactic shortcuts in XPath. One of the most uh, popular ones is the double slash because, because it allows you to get all the instances of some element from the document. So it is popular, but it can have some side effects because in fact, it is a shortcut for the descendant or self node expression. Uh, and uh, therefore, if you are to select the last section in the book and you do it like this, you will actually get each section that is last in its chapter, not the last section in the whole book because of uh, what the expression really means. So in that case, uh, you would need to choose another axis to get the re really last section in the book. Uh, um, right, so that's XPath. Um, I'm going through it real quick because it's just a reminder. Um, so XML schema. XML schema is a language that you can use to actually describe um, what should be in your XML document. And then you can validate those documents using that schema programmatically. Um, XML schema itself is an XML document. So it is a language written in XML. Um, and it looks something like this. On top, we have the XML schema, which will have some definitions in it saying what elements should be used. Um, the language of the XML schema is in is defined within this namespace. So again, even if you are creating an XML schema, you need to know about namespaces and you need to use the correct namespaces. Otherwise, all the tools won't be able to understand uh, the schema. And then you have the actual document that should be compliant or valid against that schema. Uh, and uh, a good practice is that the document itself links to the XML schema that uh, against which it should be valid. Um, it is not uh, like uh, necessary to do this, but it is a good practice so that the validators can find the schema automatically. Here it is just a relative path. So, uh, and one more, one more thing here, uh, we say that this schema actually doesn't use namespaces. So it is a no namespace schema um but in web services we will typically have schemas that target some particular namespaces so then it will look differently and i will show you how in a, in a moment um, one of the things that the schema defines is data types of uh, values so of content of elements or attributes um, and uh, there are various types there are simple types such as string boolean date date time um, what else? Uh, well, those are the basic ones. Numbers, of course. So those are all simple types, and uh, they can be used to define the expected content of both elements and attributes. Then you have complex types, which define also 
uh, nested elements, which can be used within other elements. And uh, yeah, as a side note, you can define groups of elements and groups of attributes to be used in definitions of individual elements and uh, well, attributes elsewhere. Uh, let's have an example. So this is an XML schema for an address element. Uh, and we will define first a complex type and we'll name it. Now, if the schema targets some particular namespace, this will create the complex type um, type address in that namespace. We need to be aware of this when we then use uh, that complex type, for instance, to say that there will be an XML element named address, which will have this type. So here, actually, this was not part of any namespace, or it was part of the default namespace. That's why here we do not have a prefix name or qualified name, but we have just type address. Um, right, this says that the address element here will have a street, a number, and a city element, and they will be string, an integer, and a string, and there will be an attribute named country of some type, doesn't matter what this actually is, and there can be a default value of an attribute. And now this is interesting because it means that if the attribute value is not known, it is the same as if it would be CZ, but only implementations knowing about the XML schema can actually fill in the value because without this schema, the XML document will just not have the attributes and that's it. Uh, yeah. Right, uh, we already talked about this. This is uh, uh, the whole tree of defined uh, types in the XML schema language. So you can see the ones we talked about, Boolean strings, um, date, time, time, date, and so on. But there is a lot more, for instance, all different types of numbers. Um, so sometimes you might come across some of these. Uh, one interesting one is any URI, which can be used whenever an attribute or a element contains a URI or an IRI. Right. Uh, when you are creating a schema, there is also a decision tree like this one. Um, when you need help with deciding whether you should use a simple um, type or a complex type and simple content or complex content. If you are not sure, you can use this decision tree and it works like this. So you are creating an element, right? You are defining an element using XML schema. So does it have sub elements or attributes? Well, if the answer is no, then you are using a simple type. Um, if the answer is yes, then you are using a complex type. So that's that's simple. Now, does it have sub elements? Because it could have sub elements or attributes. So does it have sub elements? If no, then you are using a simple content with a simple type, which in addition can have attributes. Uh, and if it has sub elements, that you are, then you are using complex content with sub elements and attributes. So this is a simple decision tree that you, you might use when you will be creating your own XML schema. Now, XML schemas and namespaces, very important for web services. Uh, here on the left, we have an XML schema. On the right, we have an XML document instance. So uh, what we can see here? Well, it is a definition of an XML schema. We define the XML schema namespace here we see the target namespace attribute. That's the namespace that the schema will define the complex types and elements in. So if we, are see, uh, if we see target namespace, this one, it means that whatever we define in the schema will be called with a qualified name, where the namespace IRI will be this one. Now, another attribute here we, uh, we can see is element form default. Uh, well, this one means that when we do not specify anything else, uh, all the elements will be defined as qualified, qualified as in qualified name. So they will all belong to this target namespace. Uh, we can then switch this, the element form, to unqualified, which means that in one schema, we might be able to define both elements within a namespace and elements with no namespace. So that's the unqualified element then. But typically, you will want to use the qualified here. And we are defining an element named add. We are creating a qualified 
uh, element name. So this is actually a qualified name with this as a local name and this as the namespace IRI, uh, which will be later used in the document. As we can see here, here we, we see n1 add. That's the defined add element in the n1 namespace. And the definition of the n1 namespace is the same as the target namespace in the schema. So we can see it matches. Um, and we can see the schema location for a schema targeting a namespace, which we haven't seen before. Uh, the syntax of the schema location attribute is the namespace URI, the, the target namespace URI, and the schema URI. So like this, we can see that this document actually uses an external schema targeting this namespace and uh, located on this URL. Um, right, and within, within uh, the add element, we have a sequence of elements in A and in B, both integers, both qualified names with, within this namespace. So again, n1 in A and n1 in B. This is a simple calculator message. We will use it in the tutorials. Now, what are the other options? Well, uh, here I removed the uh, element uh, form default and I moved the definitions to the individual elements. So here the schema is different. It says that this element is qualified and this is also qualified. So it means the same thing. The document is also the same, but it doesn't specify a default value for all these form attributes. But here, I actually switched this int A to unqualified, which means in the um, XML document instance, uh, I cannot use the N1 namespace for int A because it is defined as having no namespace. So uh, this is actually a valid document against this schema because this schema in, in, according to the schema in A is unqualified and B is qualified. So this is how the difference then looks like. Okay, so that was very, very, very quick reminder of XML, XPath and XML schema because we will use those uh, throughout the course. We are nearing the end of the lecture, but before we actually finish, there is one more uh, thing I want to show you and that is um actually what is a communication pattern um when we are going to talk about the web services later we'll see that uh, basically each web service will be a component in our um, ecosystem and uh, when you take a look at how two components communicate uh, you can see some patterns even if you do not understand what they are talking about uh, you can see for instance whether there are two components which talk with, with each other, or whether there are three components which talk um, like this, component A with component B and component B with component C. So you can see some patterns when looking from the outside um, on the, the web services. One of the most popular communication patterns is request response. That's something that we have already mentioned, right? With the HTTP protocol, which is based on the request response communication pattern. When we are later going to define our own web services, um, this is one of the typical communication patterns of a web service, but it's not the only one. We can have subscribe uh, notify, which means that um, for instance, a client registers with a server and then the server notifies the client every time something happens without the client needing to send a request. So that is actually a different communication pattern, which will later be part of the definition of an interface of a web service. Uh, right. And again, before you finish, just a quick look on how the web services will look when we will talk about them next time. So web services will be software components, which can be accessed by clients. Uh, via messages. So clients will be sending messages to the web services and web services will send messages back to the clients using one of the communication patterns. Uh, what the service does will be defined using operations. So the service will define a set of operations and each operation will have a set of messages uh, used to communicate about that particular operation. 
What's important from the architectural point of view is that there, is, there will be a clearly defined interface, which is according to or combined with the service oriented architecture. There will be a clearly defined interface and will be, it will be separated from the implementation. The implementation will be hidden from the clients, can be switched and so on, um, while the interface will be uh, visible to the clients and the clients will use it to know how to communicate with the web service. Uh, right, so we are talking about a web service interface. Um, I already mentioned operations, so those are the operations that the web service supports. And uh, what we will need to talk about is uh, a message transfer, transfer format used by a certain operation. Now messages can be sent via HTTP, that's one of the options. But messages can also be sent, for instance, via email. That's also possible to create a web service that communicates via email, because why not? So that's another message transfer format. And there will be others. Um, SOAP will be one of those, and we will talk about SOAP next time. Uh, then when we have the message transfer format, so the way of transferring actual messages, we'll need to talk about messaging formats. So the formats of the actual messages being sent somewhere, and of course, we need to know where to send those messages using the message transfer formats. So this will all be part of the web service interface. Uh, and uh, the, I guess the last, yeah, the last thing I want to talk about is a web service contract. That's uh, basically a description of the web service and what to expect from it. And typically it has two parts. One is technical, which contains the description of the web service interface. But then it can also be um, also have a human readable part um, that contains such a thing as a service level agreement, SLA. So how often is the service down? What can we expect? And so on. Uh, what does the service mean? And when should we use it? And uh, there may be some documentation of what the service does. Well, I will finish with a overview of uh, different web service stacks which are mm, present or used on the web today um, so what we talked about can be implemented by any of those web service technological stacks uh, so if we are talking about enterprise or government um, environments then typically we will see the w3c style web services that's what we will start our course with uh, and there we'll use uh, XML for messaging, SOAP and HTTP for message transfer. We'll use XML schema for definition of the messages. And we'll use WSDL for description of the interface. And then there is a set of extending standards providing more functionality. If we are talking about the web, so not a controlled environment, then we'll talk about RESTful web services and we'll talk about linked data services. There are other stacks uh, also used on the web that we won't talk about. If we are talk talking about research, so where is the research in web services heading? Then we will talk about also semantic web services, and uh, we'll talk about it later, because actually the research in the semantic web services branch is a little bit dead, uh, but I will mention it anyway. And we'll talk about linked data uh, services. So this semester, this is what awaits you. And um, tomorrow we have our first tutorial. Um, okay, how many of you plan to attend tomorrow's tutorial? Just for the information. Okay, 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 yeah. There will be one organization challenge. As I mentioned, there are 27 people enrolled in this course, but the room for tomorrow's tutorial has 14 places. So it will be a bit challenging, but uh, yeah, you'll have to do somehow. Um, probably some of you who won't fit in the, in the lab will sit in the big lab and uh, I will make it work somehow. So, uh, yeah. Uh, well, the tutorials again are described on the web page, including the slides. And um, the slides also have uh, speaker notes explaining the possible pitfalls that you may come across that uh, I will help you avoid on the, uh, on the tutorial. But if you miss it, 
nothing will happen, but there will be a, a homework from each uh, or from 10 of the tutorials. And the homework will always be due before the next tutorial. So one week. Even if you miss your tutorial, you still need to turn in the homework. Um, but still, you should have all the information necessary included in the slides. So it shouldn't be a major problem if you miss a tutorial. Yep. Any questions before we finish today? Yep. Yep. Uh, no, there are no recordings. There are just slides with all the information that I would normally say written. Uh, and uh, yeah, this semester I'm creating recordings. Okay, so that's all for today and uh, see you tomorrow on the tutorial.